Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be talking about the complications of reverse total shoulder replacements and the management of these. So the first reverse total shoulder prosthesis was designed by Paul Grimont, who was a Frenchman back in 1987. The idea of the prosthesis is that it distalizes the humerus or the humeral shaft and medializes the center of rotation, which aids to tension the deltoid muscle to become the functional muscle that moves the shoulder uh, in patients that have a def uh, deficient rotator cuff. By doing this, it reduces the mechanical torque at the glenoid and is thought to also reduce the loosening of the glenoid component. Unfortunately, for the first series of reverse total shoulders, the complication rates were quite high and up to 50%, and the reoperation rates were even up to 40% as well. In terms of uh, this talk, I'm going to be uh, firstly going through what, what are called problems um, versus complications. So problems are events that are unlikely to affect a patient's final outcome, whereas complications are events that are more likely to have a negative influence on the patient's final outcome. And these definitions come from a large systematic review back in 2011, which is where I've pulled a lot of the data from, uh, which is one of the biggest series we have uh, from Zumstein in 2011. In terms of problems, these are things like um, heterotopy ossification, hematomas, uh, CRPS, intraop dislocations are like where you've had a dislocation right at the end of the case when you've already sewn up and had to close reduce, but it hasn't had an effect on the patient's final outcome. Uh, so things that generally are seen as issues but don't affect the final outcome. And one that I've got here, scapular notching, is quite controversial, and I will talk about that individually, as many people think that is actually a complication of reverse total shoulder arthroplasty and can affect the patient's final outcome. In this uh, systematic review, the incidence of problems occurring was about 44%. Whereas complications, uh, things like, and we'll be going through most of these, instability, dislocation, infection, loosening, fracture, and nerve palsies. Uh, the incidence in this systematic review of complications for post-op complications were 21%, uh, and total complications, that includes intra-op complications, of 24%. And another systematic review from 2016 showed that approximately 15% uh, for total complications after reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Um, all of the intra-op complications in this uh, first systematic review were fractures, of which there were 16 humeral fractures, 7 glenoid fractures, and 1 acromion fracture from a transacromium approach. This is the data from the systematic review, including 782 reverse total shoulders with an average follow-up time of 42 months. And I'll be going through these um, individually. So firstly, just to talk about scapular notching, uh, this is defined as glenoid neck erosion from repeated contact, uh, whereby the humeral prosthesis is hitting the inferior scapular neck when the patient goes into AD duction, and it was first uh, described by Sivero in 1997. It's very common for the Grammont prosthesis because of the way that it lowers and medializes the center of rotation. Uh, it brings that, um, that humeral shaft or humeral stem uh, and this, the humeral tray much closer to the scapular neck. Uh, the other prosthesis that's commonly used is called the Encore prosthesis or the Frankel prosthesis, which was designed by uh, a guy named Mark Frankel, a US um, orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and so it's, it's, this is, a, I'll talk about it specifically, but it lateralizes the center of rotation and so reduces the risk of scapular notching. The effect of this notching is controversial. So uh, the systematic review that I'm pulling most of my data from says that it's a, a problem and doesn't affect the final outcome based on the majority of the studies, um, especially the, the higher quality studies. However, there's a new meta-analysis in 2020 suggesting that patients that have scapular notching have worse outcome scores and range of motion. And some studies may suggest that it contributes to the glenoid component loosening. So the way to avoid it is by placing the glenoid component more inferiorly, uh, and that takes the, the humeral tray away from the scapular neck and using larger size implants with more shallow concave components. Just with the meta-analysis, the unfortunately many of the studies in the, the analysis didn't account for confounding factors, so you need to sort of read into it with care because um, garbage in equals garbage out essentially. So these are some pictures of scapular notching. So the picture on the left shows a significant scapular neck notching from the inframedial aspect of the humeral tray. And the picture on the right 
uh, shows the difference between the uh, central rotation between the Grammont processes and the Encore processes. So the Grammont processes can kind of be thought of as like an inlay, uh, inlay processes compared to the uh, the Encore, which was, uh, as I said, introduced by this guy Mark Frankel in 2002, and can be thought of more of as an onlay processes. So and the only thing with the Encore processes is that it increases shear forces at the bone implant interface of the glenoid, and so it may lead to increased glenoid component loosening. In terms of instability and dislocation, the incidence in this review was 4.7%, and it's uh, actually it's two to three times higher in patients that are having a reverse total shoulder when they've had failed primary so shoulder surgery, such as a previous hemiarthroplasty or a prior reverse total shoulder. The, the risk is increased with the delta pectoral approach. However, I, I feel that there are probably confounding factors with this and because the delta pectoral approach is the most commonly used approach and it's likely to be utilized by more inexperienced surgeons as well rather than say the supralateral approach. And the factors that contribute to instability and dislocation, uh, the main factor is thought to be the lack of soft tissue tension. Uh, and that can be due to shortening of the humerus from bone loss or a, a cut that's been made too distal or medialization, the glenoid from bone loss or excessive reaming. So it's really important to, um, uh, to um, recreate that vertical and lateral offset with the prosthesis position to allow for that appropriate deltoid tensioning. The other factors considered are mechanical impingement. So in patients that are obese, it has a sort of a cam type effect that can lever on the prosthesis and cause dislocation. The other thing is humeral malunion. If you've got more bone medially, that's potentially uh, levering the the processes out of out of joint. Uh, if you mismatch the glenosphere and humeral socket, that's going to increase the risk of dislocation. And if you put the improper version on the processes as well. Now, the the role of subscapularis is very controversial in terms of stability. Um, most or so, some of the studies will say that it has a significant effect that reduces the chance of dislocation, especially in, when it's repaired in delta pectoral approaches. Others will say it makes no difference at all, uh, and so it's something that's very contentious at this time. In terms of the management for dislocation, this is split into early and late dislocation. So with early dislocation, the management is an immediate close reduction and then slinging the patient with an abduction brace for six weeks. Uh, there's, there's a large study by Boileau, who's a um, quite a, a, a renowned shoulder surgeon, uh, who found that this was only successful in his case series by about 40%, um, but up to 60% in the um, most successful studies that have reported the treatment for early dislocation. And so recurrent dislocation often requires a revision, whereby you need to pay close attention to that soft tissue tension as well as the version of the prosthesis and also consider increasing the size of the glenosphere, the humeral tray or the poly to increase that tension and uh, increase the stability. Late dislocation is often due to the lack of soft tissue tension as well and the revision um, in, in terms of this is needs to address the bony defects whereby I was talking about before the like humeral shortening or the glenoid medialization. And then uh, it suggested that all patients should have an abduction brace after revision to shorten the deltoid and increase its length tension uh, to increase stability. This picture shows how replacing the proximal humerus bone loss or lateralizing the glenoid via bone grafting uh, of the defect can increase the deltoid wrapping angle uh, and improve soft tissue tension and hence stability. Moving on to prosthetic joint infection, the incidence in the study was approximately 3.8%. This is likely an underestimate as many of the stiff shoulders that we see may in fact be chronically infected with low virulence organisms such as C. acnes. It's more common in patients that have had prior shoulder surgery and the most common bacteria, as, as I said, C. acnes, Staph epidermidis and Staph aureus. The approach needs to be a multidisciplinary approach with close involvement of the infectious diseases team. And at revision, it's really important to send off at least five samples with extended cultures for C. acnes. In terms of the management of acute infection, um, irrigation and debridement is often curative and generally doesn't affect the functional final outcome for the patient. And while in there, it's recommended to replace all components that are easily replaceable, such as the poly and the glenosphere. 
in terms of chronic infection, um, the, it's really important to actually uh, have a sit down discussion with the patient and make sure that their expectations are understood because all patients that have chronic infection in a reverse shoulder arthroplasty will have a poorer functional outcome than those that have just had a primary um, reverse total shoulder. Irrigation debridement, so a DARE procedure, often uh, fails if done alone. And so there's a number of options in terms of resection arthroplasty, uh, which is usually usually uh, utilized for frail patients or patients that can't under, uh, undertake a longer operation. Uh, resistant bacteria, or whereby you've had other treatments already fail, um, such as a, you've had a prior revision that's failed. Implant exchange is generally the choice of management and, and you've got to be considerate of the soft tissues and the risk of fracture and bone loss when trying to remove the humeral stem especially, and, but also the, the bone loss on the glenoid side which may need to be grafted. So a lot of studies will say to consider a humerotomy or an osteotomy of the humerus uh, to allow to get out that humeral stem. Uh, there's talk about single stage versus two stage revisions and they suggest that you can trial a single stage revision where the bacteria is known in advance and it's a sensitive bacteria as a single stage revision will lead to a better functional outcome. However, if there's any concerns at all, like you don't know the bacteria or it's a multi-resistant bacteria, then a two-stage procedure with an antibody impregnated spacer for six to eight weeks prior to re-implantation of components is suggested. These are some pictures, just some examples of some spaces that have been used um, in different studies. And also on the right hand side, an osteotomy of the humerus to allow for placement of a large revision stem. Moving on to glenoid loosening and disassembly, the incidence of this is different based on the type of prosthesis utilised, but approximately 3.5%. And it's almost twice as more common in the encore or Frankel prosthesis. The actual disassembly of the uh, glenoid side is actually very rarely seen now or no longer seen with the Morse taper fixation of the glenosphere on the on the base plate. And so asymptomatic or aseptic loosening uh, of the glenoid side is thought to be mostly due to technical error now. So if you place the, glenos uh, the glenoid base plate too superiorly uh, or you incline it too superiorly as well, it increases the, the shear forces placed on the glenoid prosthesis bone interface and will lead to loosening. And also, if you are use it, utilizing bone graft on the glenoid side and you don't use a long enough central peg or long enough surrounding screws, and those screws only have purchase in the graft rather than the native bone, that also increases the risk of glenoid loosening. In terms of management of this, this is a very complex um, uh, management issue and has a number of treatment algorithms that I've found from uh, various papers. The thought is for contained cavity defects that impacted cancellous allograft is usually sufficient. Uh, so that's the, the top um, uh, picture there, or the top part of the picture where you've got a, um, a cavitary defect. In this, the next two down where you've got uncontained wall defects or severe bone loss, then the thought is uh, these require bone reconstruction and the best choice is an autologous tricortical iliac crest graft. And so the decision to um, the decision on what management you do for glenoid loosening is dependent on the severity of the bone defect, the uh, ability to main or attain stability of the bone graft. So, for instance, um, most studies would suggest that in the majority of patients you can graft it and then put the base plate over the graft. However, if you've got a severe bone loss, then it may be more suitable to put to place a graft there and then some kind of spacer. Uh, to allow for the graft to incorporate prior to um, going back and attaching the base plate. You also need to ensure that the central peg is in at least five millimeters of native bone and the supporting screws are actually in the scapula rather than graft to prevent that subsequent loosening again. Moving on to humeral loosening. Uh, this incidence of loosening is about 1.3% and disassembly 1.5% in this study. The risk factors, as I talked about before, is the humeral bone loss. Uh, so if you, if you lose that um, bone loss, you lose the soft tissue tension as well, and that increases the uh, the forces, like the rotational forces and um, placed on the humeral stem, which can lead to loosening. And with the absence of the GT, the humeral stem, again, is only fixed distally, and so you, it has no, no um, support or prevention of the rotational stresses, and it can lead to loosening. 
softer bone in osteoporosis and very physically demanding patients are younger patients with active jobs obviously put a lot more force through their their prosthesis and can lead to loosening and then the last thought is that poly and metal debris so if the if the prosthesis is either notching and the tray is hitting the the bone and causing um, debris to be released or they've had multiple dislocations whereby um, the prosthesis and components have been scraped along each other causing that debris to be released that can lead to loosening as well in a sort of a pseudo tumor um, or an alveol kind of um, uh, picture in terms of management, usually it's pretty easy to, re um, to remove the humeral stem when it's loose to be able to revise. And if there's a less than a five centimetre defect, um, the thoughts are, especially in elderly patients, that a cement collar can be utilised. Um, or the other option is a, a large reconstruction implant, so like a proximal humeral replacement. And if it's more than a five centimetre defect, then the options are a massive humeral allograft. I've got a picture of that on the next page. And this helps to re restore the bone stock and optimise the soft tissue tension and hence reduce the rotational stresses that prevent recurrent loosening. And the other option is for if you're going to consider using an uncemented stem that you can potentially lock it distally with, um, with screws to reduce that rotational stress. So this is a picture on the left hand side showing a loose humeral stem with a significant bone loss. And then in the middle is a massive allograft with a step cut that's been performed at the distal aspect to neutralize the rotational stress. And then the final um, implant with that allograft on the right hand side. Moving on to periprosthetic fracture. Uh, the incidence of glenofractures intraoperatively is extremely low. And, but humeral fractures is definitely higher and higher at the revision, um, at the time of revision as well. So the considerations in terms of reducing the chance of glenoid fracture is to make sure that the rema is on full speed before you contact the bone so that it doesn't grab and twist at the bone and produce that torque that can cause the fracture. Don't ream past the subchondral bone down to the soft metaphyseal bone. And always ream the humeral canal by hand, so you're reducing the excessive torque that would potentially go through if the rema, a power rema, got caught against the inner aspect of the, the canal. And, and then in a revision setting, consider an osteotomy to reduce the chance of splitting apart the humerus. So for glenoid fractures, a management of small fractures can include fragments of specific fixation or just redirecting the, the position of the base plate, but ensuring you're not placing it too superiorly, whereby you may increase the chance of glenoid loosening. In terms of large fractures, a two-stage procedure with initial bone grafting and then coming back and later putting on a new base plate is generally recommended. For displaced humeral fractures, uh, this, one of the studies that I was reading about, one of the largest studies was saying that um, these are generally treated with uh, internal fixation, but also with iliac crest bone grafting to increase the chance of union. For minimally displaced or transverse and spiral fractures, the consideration is always to non-operative first with the limb immobilised in neutral rotation or abduction to prevent a rotational malunion. And I'll show you a picture of a non-operatively managed fracture on the next page as well. But if the stem is loose, then obviously it will require revision, and this is um, with a longer stem to bridge the fracture. So on the left-hand side here, we've got a, a long spiral displaced fracture, which has been treated with an internal fixation and circlage wiring. And on the right-hand side is a less displaced fracture, which has been treated non-operatively, and has gone on to a slight varus malunion, however, with a good functional outcome for the patient. Uh, the final type of fractures that patients can get are acromial and scapular spine fractures with, um, in this study, had a combined incidence of 1.5%. It's thought that by increasing the deltoid tension and medializing the center of rotation, it increases the load across the acromion, which can increase the chance of fracture, especially in osteoporotic patients. So the consideration is to always place the, um, the glenosphere inferiorly where possible and avoid superior base plate screws that are potentially going in and cre creating stress rises. Uh, consideration of the implant design and the, gr the Grammont uh, prosthesis with its medialization can increase the risk of these type of fractures. And then if the soft tissue tension is too tight to consider either uh, distalizing the stem or doing a, a more distal cut to allow for reduced tension, obviously balancing that with the risk of instability. Uh, generally, like, there's, there's no real treatment algorithm for these type of fractures because they're quite rare, but generally the acromial fractures are managed non-operatively and have variable outcomes for patients. And scapular spine fractures are thought to have poor outcomes with non-operative management, so are generally recommended to be fixed. So the last complication I'll be talking about is nerve injury, and this has a, a varying incidence from 1.2 to 4.3%. Now, 
In this study, they included radial nerve palsies in the setting of humeral fracture, so that would um, increase the number. Uh, so we're, we're sort of potentially not talking about isolated nerve injuries uh, here. It's um, a combination of all. The most common are brachial plexus injuries and axillary nerve, and there's a number of causes which I've listed here. Uh, so tractioning of the arm, um, aberrant retractor placement. Uh, with regards to the relative length in the arm, uh, so there's a study that has shown that um, the distalization of the humeral shaft and the medialization can increase the strain on the median nerve roots by up to 19% and it can cause a, a traction neuropraxia. Uh, it can be a direct injury to the nerve, obviously, and then compression from post-op hematoma. Almost all of these are treated with observation alone and then for subsequent EMG follow-up to ensure there's recovery of the nerve. I'll just put this slide in here. I thought this was a little bit interesting. Uh, this was this is US data from 1988 to 2000 for all total shoulder arthroplasty. So that includes anatomic and reverse. Uh, this is including nearly 12,600 proces uh, procedures performed. So the interesting uh, points are that if you are having an operation, or if a patient's having an operation on a surgeon that performs less than two total shoulders per year, their risk of out, um, risk of complications is at approximately 1.46%. Now, I'm not sure how that equates to the previous studies that have shown sort of up to 20% uh, risk of complications, but maybe this study just has less, or they, they didn't specify what complications they were including in the study. But the interesting fact is if you've got a shoulder surgeon that's quite experienced and does more than five of these a year, your risk of a uh, complication is significantly reduced to 0.8%. So there's almost a 1.5 times risk of complication by having an operation by an inexperienced surgeon. Uh, and that's the same with mortality as well. It goes up by uh, nearly 4.4 times. Uh, and the length of stay is longer for inexperienced surgeons as well in this study. And then this is the final slide um, for this is in terms of complications for reverse total shoulders where they've been done for a failed primary surgery. As you would expect, these are higher than um, the primary reverse total shoulders. And the highest risk of uh, complications is in those patients who have had a previously failed reverse total shoulder and ha having a revision reverse total shoulder for that reason, whereby the complication rate is uh, over 50, 56%. The most common uh, complication, as expected, is instability, accounting for 3.3% of all these complications. So in summary, the complication rate for reverse total shoulder is thought to be somewhere between 15 to 24%. It's essential to get the soft tissue tension correct to reduce the complications, but also increase the uh, or improve the outcomes for patients. Scapular notching is controversial, but may contribute to poorer outcomes. And a DARE procedure or a um, debridement antibiotics and implant retention is usually curative in the ac acute prosthetic joint infections. Loosening is a complex scenario and often requires bony reconstruction. And it's always important to be gentle with the soft tissues and the instruments to avoid a periprosthetic fracture. Thanks very much.